Okay. singers, um, how should I select it in terms of you know, what should be maybe the first thing in my mind? Conservative, yeah. you know, until you really know their capabilities, and you always have to be thinking, you know, it's a very changeable instrument that you're dealing with, mm -hmm. and you may assign a piece thinking, you know, well, by the time we get this all worked in and all, it's going to be great, and their voice is in a completely different place three months later or six months later. Uh oh, you know, this piece that we thought was going to be great for this competition, their voice has shifted some, and now it's awkward for them. And so, you know, you have to be kind of noticing, oh, wait a minute. Hey, why don't, while we're at it, why don't we look at this piece too? Then you had a, you know, a plan B in place. So as far as, um, as that being conservative, so what do we mean by being conservative? What, what exactly, what are some things that we can do in terms of being cautious or conservative and how we pick our, pick our pieces for Say that fast five times. Pick your pieces for people. Okay. <laughs> no, <laughs> it's physically impossible for me to do it again. So, the length of the piece, range. the range of the piece, language, tessitura, the transition point in the range. Yeah, yeah. Is a good one. Okay, so we've been talking a lot about vocal things. So, you know, the range, the tessitura, the transition points, and somebody who said language. Okay, so language. Okay, yeah, the language. What else? What else? Um, maybe something similar to what they would like. Uh huh. Like so that's like, like finding the thing yeah. that clicks with them. I mean, if they want to sing like Christina Aguilera, you might Have find something <laughs> kind of something uh, like that, but yes. not that at all. <laughs> Well, you know, a nice, listen, Christina in a, you know, in a healthy way. Or like, I mean, yeah. years ago, Madonna had this song, Crazy For You, you know, which is a really pretty nice ballad, you know? Um, it wasn't... Is it I Wanna Have You Now? Crazy. Yeah. Does you wanna say you know it's, it's true. 13, 12, 30, I want to say? Yeah. Um, I know what you're saying, though. Something that they want, to, they're going to be excited about. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right, we've talked about language. There's one other thing that you have to kind of be weighing. Um, uh, well, yeah, that's gonna that's gonna be playing into all of it. Level of difficulty. Yeah, 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 yeah. Musical. Okay, so we're really looking at then four things. So we're really thinking about, you've got a couple of different things that you're weighing. Do not correct this at home. I am a professional. <laughs> um, musical. challenges really that we're having to think about, you know, vocally about their range, their tessitura, their um, transition points and things, expressive, you know, <coughs> forget the, the vocal part of it. And there are uh, themes that, that may not be. Yeah, you point. know, um, a song that's written for a character that's much older than them, for instance, mm -hmm. um, you know, forget about the vocal difficulties. An 18-year-old or a 17-year-old has 
us no clue of the emotional stuff that is there in some of the later Strauss songs, you know? I mean, the depth of emotion that talking in like a song like The Bright or the Four Last Songs or things like that, you know, you just, there's not a lot of people who at that age who have that emotional maturity. Forget the vocal challenges. So expressive things, what, what are they gonna connect with as, as Catherine was saying? And then the musical difficulties, you know, are the rhythms too challenging? Um, you know, is it an odd key? Does it modulate a lot? Um, does the accompaniment support them or not? And then the language, um, you know, how, how facile are they with learning other languages? Um, particularly with younger singers, you wanna give them probably one challenge, not four. Yes, ma'am. Um, what, what's your opinion on um, teaching beginning IPA to students? I think if the students in, in, the, in this case are um, motivated and you can talk to them about the importance of it and why it makes sense to learn this, um, by all means, you know, there's no reason that high school kids cannot learn IPA. I have had students who came into school here who already knew IPA, either from private lessons or from their choir director. So absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, my sister has an Yeah, absolutely. I can't think of one, honestly, provided that they are motivated and they, you know, really can see why, why, why should I bother doing this? Uh, that it's going to help them be able to sing in multiple languages, you know, and understand sounds and things like that in other languages. Uh, it will really help them along, particularly if you've got people who are interested in majoring in music. You know, I think absolutely they'll really have a leg up on college. And so, you know, with younger singers, you want to give them one challenge, not four. So a piece that's got vocal challenges, but expressive-wise, it's like it really clicks with them. Musically, it's not difficult stuff. Language-wise, it's something you know, a language they've grown up speaking a lot, you know, because the vocal things are gonna be enough for their brain. Um, and in fact, this is pretty pretty good for all of us. Until you get to really advanced singers, juggling more than one big challenge, that can get really, really, that's a lot of windows open, you know, so to speak, in your head. Yeah, like if they're labeled, you know, kind of this way. I mean, yeah, <laughs> I, I mean, I've told you guys, singing, the hardest thing I've ever had to learn was Survivor from Warsaw is chorus stuff. We're all singing unison, but we're singing a 12 tone row by Schoenberg, and the orchestra is playing like crazy, and we're singing Hebrew. <laughs> so it was a language thing, it was a musical thing, it was just being able to hear myself thing, you know? Um, so it was really just two big challenges, because it wasn't vocally hard, and you know, the text was, I was mature enough, it was about a man who was going in to, uh, he was in the line to go into the gas chamber. Yeah. And how the men all started singing this prayer as they were going in. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a heart-rending piece. Um, but, you know, it was the musical stuff and the language thing. It was all I could do to, to, you know, just to sing this unison line with all these other guys. Granted, I was kind of a special needle, but still, <laughs> um, I had to do it. Um, okay, so what two big things are normal with younger voices? And she's incapable of doing yeah. it. So yeah. you're wasting That's your breath I mean. and you're not and, and you're not <laughs> serving her as a teacher to insist upon something that is not gonna really be healthy for her if she tries to push to do it, and that she's really not there capable yet muscularly. So, you know, 
Can you encourage that? Sure, you can give them little light staccato exercises and bounced, you know, ah, 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 bounce patterns and things. But, you know, insisting on something from them that you expect as an adult at 22, 25, 30, no. Your adult aesthetic needs to take a chill pill while you <laughs> let them be a kid, you know? The, the world pushes people to be adults fast enough. When they do get to the age where you can start teaching them then, how do you fix broken wrists? I use Ducati, I use the Messi Moche, I use, uh, we'll talk about what do we do as corrective things next semester, but um, it's a rare person that I, and I will usually wait until mm -hmm. they are early 20s before I start trying to say little fry and things like that. I would want to make sure that they have really grown up a little bit more first. Um, okay. Um, so, going once, going twice, two big things that are normal. You mentioned breathiness. Yeah, what's another one? Yeah, that's really, really like elementary kids usually. Breaking. Um, okay, the one I'm looking for is, is that they tire easily. They tire easily. Um, the first one was quick Well, that they have a breathy sound. Okay. For whatever reason. You know, sometimes things are ascribed to cord closure, and they're really not cords, they're folds. Uh, are ascribed to that which it actually could just be acoustical distuning and you hear a noise that you, you know, but it's actually not the fact that they're just so weak there. So there's a lot of reasons why something sounds turbulent. Um, breathiness, because of Delano things, is certainly part of it. Um, there's a lot of things to keep in mind, you know. Um, so yeah, just don't impose your adult aesthetic on young singers in terms of their endurance, in terms of maturity to deal with the text. You know, I mean, I remember, like, I was at something, and these middle schoolers, I was judging a, a, a solo and ensemble thing for some private schools, some private and parochial schools in Colorado, and these were middle schoolers, and they were singing, you know, Mozart Requiem. It's like, really? Yeah. I mean, Vocally, expressive, musical, language. The, and when it was like, okay, well, you've hit the trifecta there, you know, you were <laughs> throwing them some challenges. And the kids obviously were struggling mightily, you know. Um, I'm all for giving people an appropriate challenge. But you have to take off your adult mindset and think, okay, I'm 11 years old and I'm in this group and my voice gets tired really quick and you know, and it's breathy, and I can't make this long phrase, and I don't understand what this text means, and I can't make these sounds right, and you know, and, and the rehearsals are too long. Teach love too. Yeah, you exactly. Gotta teach them the love of music at that point. And they don't want you don't want them to feel defeated, physically, emotionally, spiritually, um, by the music. So you really have to balance this very, very carefully. Um, okay. You have a dad to do. Let's go on. So if you'll take out that handout that had voice development issues, let's look at the back side. I guess you, as much as I bob around up here, you guys probably feel like mm -hmm. watching the tennis match. It's really neat. It's engaging. Well, it's just me being hyper. Okay, so on the back, female voice change. You know, we always talk about what happens to the guys, but girls go through a rather sizable change too. And if you're interested, I do not get a kickback from this, but it's a great book. It's Lynn Gackle's book, Finding Ophelia's Voice, Opening Ophelia's Heart. I strongly recommend it. I've talked about her before. Um, it, she talks about physiological things, psychological things, musical development. It's a great book. It's a really, really great book. And it's got a DVD in the back, which um, time permitting, we'll look at it today, but certainly on Wednesday, she has examples of girls at different stages of the change. And uh, I also have the change. <laughs> um, 
And then I also have uh, a website, um, a lady I know in England who has boys at different stages of change. And either today or Wednesday we'll watch that. It just depends on how our time goes. So, find a healthy means of developing musical skills, expression, and creativeness. So this means you as the director have to be really creative. Because you're going to walk in and you'll have all this music picked and then you hear the kids and it's like, oh my gosh, I'm going to have to arrange this piece because my kids can't sing it. You know, I'm going to have to transpose it or I'm going to have to rewrite this part. Is it any wonder that some of these famous choral directors, I mean, Lynn Gackle has a whole series of pieces that she either arranges or edits. Um, Dr. Mabry has written pieces, arrangements, and so on. Um, I don't know that Dr. Slandin, he's he edits a lot of manuscripts and, and mm -hmm. things like that, and you know does a lot of historical work. Um, but you know, Ren Stroop, you know, you can go buy all his you know arrangements and things and compositions, and Ren Clausen, and on and on and on. The reason that people have done this is they were teachers in the schools, and they're like, gosh, you know, these pieces that I thought were going to work for these kids are not working, and they learn how to arrange things. So it's a really great skill to learn how to do that. And, you know, we got people on our faculty here who've written choral works. Dr. Whitman has, Dr. Mabry has, you know, uh, Dr. Valentine has. So you go talk to some of these composition people, uh, uh, Dr. Styler has, yeah, you go talk with them and you say, okay, I want to learn how to arrange choral music, you know? Um, a patient, flexible methodology. And so you develop your methodology by first having the information base about the instrument that you're teaching. That's what we're doing here. We'll talk about methodology a lot next semester. Think about the long-term and short-term health of the people you're working with first, and the competitions and the musicals and things second. If you do the first thing, developing their musical skills and expression, and you look out for their long-term as well as their short-term development, then the competitions and the things are going to come. You know, they're going to do well because your kids will sing well, and it'll be they'll be doing appropriate literature. They'll be free to express, you know. Um, develop good vocal hygiene early. So you model good habits for them in your speaking, in your singing. And there are things during rehearsals. You know, you just throw it in. Okay, everybody, let's see how many water bottles. You know, bonus points for everybody who has a water bottle. Boy, you're going to see water bottles really fast if you start <laughs> saying that. Okay? What good is it to be a fabulous conductor if your singers sound crappy? <laughs> so, you know, take care of the singers. It's, it's wonderful to have, you know, beautiful conducting te technique, you know, and so on. But you're the voice teacher for those people you're working with. Um, there's a good quote from Gackle. These symptoms of changing voice, these are really, really important things. And this is boys and girls. Insecurity about singing the right note. You start hearing register bridges where before you may not have noticed them. Their voices sound husky. Um, you'll hear that with the boys especially. Um, inconsistent range, you know. One day they, they're they singing soprano and then the next day they're like, um, Mr. Smith, can I sing alto today? Because my, my voice, the high stuff just doesn't feel real good today. You know, and then the next day they're fine with singing soprano again. Um, <laughs> cracking on high notes, uncomfortable. It's like, oh, my voice doesn't feel very comfortable. If you teach middle school kids and early, even high school, they'll come into the lessons and say, you know, my voice just, just doesn't feel good. And you say, well, what have you been doing? And there's nothing going on that they've been, you know, overusing their voice and they're not sick. They're just growing up. Um, low endurance. Lowered speaking voice, you'll hear that. Um, puberty in females is occurring earlier and earlier. Mm -hmm. It's fascinating. Is it diet? Is it societal pressures? And there's also some evidence linking 
warmer climates and puberty occurring, occurring earlier. And we live in a warm climate. Um, so I guess what, sit there fighting war away or something? Um, anyway, um, good rules to follow when working with young singers. Descending vocal leases, um, that's a lot with uh, Ken Phillips and Henry Leck and um, Lynn Gackle and a number of people really advocating that. Um, don't expect an adult sound, be careful with your language. We've been talking about that all semester, you know. The, the terms you use are gonna be the terms they think with when they're thinking about singing. So you wanna have them thinking with the right language. Rotate people on parts. You know, this is just great advice for anybody working with groups of singers. Um, not just slanting and rotates you guys around some, right, you know, so that you're not stuck on the same high part or low part. You know, he's gonna move you around and Mabry does that, and a lot of people do that, you know, to take advantage of the strengths of the singers as well as to give them a rest from being stuck in one part of their range. Um, pick rep conservatively, and with the young ones, pieces that are slow and sustained, be sparing with that, because that's probably the most taxing thing for them because if, they're, if they tend to struggle with breath management anyway, and then you give them a piece that's got long, slow phrases, you know, not that you don't want to challenge them, but maybe challenge them in exercises that you give them, rather than a piece they have to sing publicly until they're really, really getting there, okay? Yes? They can also be that they haven't learned the uh, breath management and vowel modification that they need to access that range. Mm -hmm. Or, I'm sad to say, you know, they were a good musician and their choir director said, you know, I don't really need you on that inner part, and they got put on a part that was probably lower than they needed. A third thing that happens is if they have a sizable voice and they would stick out like a sore thumb. Yeah in the choir if they really let it rip, and so they get put on a lower part. I mean, my wife went into college, you know, as a mezzo-soprano, and was continued to be trained as a mezzo-soprano. Well, you know, it wasn't until she was doing her doctorate that she really was in the right tessitura-wise for her music. So, do it, you know, challenge people and test people with, with with challenging exercises, but with the repertoire, you want to just try to find things, and that's another good reason for rotating people on parts that they're not just always stuck on the low part. Were you singing alto in my whole life? Yeah, and I was were you? Life in here. Yeah, and you were. Mm -hmm. How many of you ladies were singing low parts in high school? Probably most of the room. Mm -hmm. Not you? Yeah, it's not weird. <laughs> That's interesting. Of course, you, you've moved up and I think but it's also, been the right move by far. Yeah, I also think um, my choir wasn't like a very good choir. So I think, I sing second soprano. Yeah. So I think he was like, it doesn't matter if she's, that song if she's singing. And you know, honestly, for a lot of people, singing second soprano is the safest place because, man, those choral parts can be brutal while on first soprano. Mm -hmm. You know? Oh, yeah. And it's often very wise to rotate people. You know, that people are on a part, on a piece-by-piece -piece basis, rather than you're always this. Yeah. Um, it's just healthier for people. Okay, I have some handouts, and I also have um, a PowerPoint. So, if I could get some help handing some things out, that would be Groovalicious. So, this one is mine. You don't get that one. But, but I want all your notes. You can, make me smarter. You can hand that one out. Okay. So what you've done to my accordion folder, too. Oh, wow. I still. 
And so um, Stacy is handing out um, something about aging older singers. And then these two, which I would love to have someone handing out. These two are review sheets. Okay, so this one is a health and hygiene review sheet. Try to not use your notes and see from what you've read if you can answer things and bring it then to class on Wednesday. So you want to hand that one out? Is that all you need? Okay. Okay. And this one has kind of da 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 da. Has yes, thank you. Um, um, yeah. Um, this one has group questions, and I want you to read through them and have kind of some things in mind because we'll break into some groups. You may take it. And bless you. Thank you. And so, on Wednesday, and whatever we don't get to on Wednesday, we'll do on Friday, and yes, I'll bring the camera on Friday, and I'll put it up on whiteboard. So if you can come on Friday at 11, please do. If you can't, we'll be doing more review things, and, um, and we'll have you done. And of course, I was going to be getting the computer ready whilst I babbled, and I didn't. It's like Okay. Gotta get my laptop here. Almost fully relevant. So yes, please talk amongst yourselves for just a moment. I shall be right with you. So you guys have been seeing my thing about the everybody sing Amazing Grace, mm -hmm. yes. Martin Luther King Day at, at 11. So, yeah, fantastic. Thank you. So, you know, we have the largest march in the United States, in San Antonio. 300,000 people come out. Yeah, that is awesome. So, I mean, more than Atlanta. You know, you'd think Atlanta, because that's, you know, where he was from. But, but no. Anyway, um, so I wrote uh, Chris Arneson, who teaches at Westminster Choir College, because he used to give Obama voice coachings. And uh, I said, do you have any way, you know, like any insight? And he was like, uh, no, no, actually no. And um, so I went to the White House website and I basically asked the president to, whatever he's doing for Martin Luther King Day at 11 o'clock, if he could help get people, you know, singing Amazing Grace, because he sings pretty nicely, actually. He really does. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I, I wrote Renee Fleming's sister and I said, if you can let fix this know, uh, mm -hmm. you know. That must be rough. And uh, sister to Renee Fleming. <laughs> no, actually, they get along great, the, and she's very supportive of her. I mean, she's basically Renee's ears. She has worked with her for years, mm -hmm. and they they get along famously. Um, and Rachel's a good. She's a good teacher. Okay, so anyway, so I'm working on that. Trying to get. Oh, oh, okay. I'm just, <laughs> just going to stand here. Was there something you needed to tell me privately? No. Mr. Nixon, I have to go single. Oh, well, anyway. So, here we go. So, if you can get out the one that says Rose Heart Lecturer, Vocal Fitness. Um, They're way too organized. Oh, there it is. Okay. So it says that because I was asked. I was asked by a uh, community here in San Antonio to come out and do some um, lectures. Basically. 
basically. And um, one was about aging and caring for your voice and so on. So I have a singer. I'm going to play this recording. Where did everybody go? One, two, three, four. One, two. Okay, Danielle is still out there. And Caitlin's still out. But this is the most fun thing we're going to do all day. Okay, so your mission then is to listen to this singer and guess how old they are, okay? We're guessing how old the singer is. Tends to 
on the exhale tends to um, be decreased because you know if the tissue is less elastic, then you're going to get less recoil. Um, decreased muscle strength and speed. Okay, men lose approximately one percent of their muscle mass throughout their entire body uh, every year past about age 35. Now you can delay and slow that. You can slow it. I don't think you can delay it. It's it's due mainly to testosterone levels. You can slow it by staying very active. You know, doing weight training and endurance training and so on. But even so, there is natural decline. I weigh the same as I weighed when I was a freshman in college, but my body fat has gone from nine percent to seventeen percent. So. There's a bit more on around the middle. As hard as I work out, I mean, yesterday I rode my bike for 20 minutes on a stationary bike. I ran three miles and I swam a thousand yards, and I still can't lose the weight. So, you know, yeah, I know, it's very discouraging. <laughs> Stiffening of the thorax, okay, so think about loss of flexibility in other body areas. The same is true locally. Decreased vital capacity, so your lung volume is, is less. There's also changes in your larynx. Um, ossification um, and calcification of the cartilages so in your larynx. So the vocal processes of your retinoids stiffen. The thyroid cartilage and the cricoid cartilage are more stiff. And at first, that's a good thing, but then as it gets more and more that direction, um, and you know, things are getting stiffer right as your muscle strength is going down. So that's why one of the reasons why sometimes with older singers, and I might point out, he was singing some enchanted evening down a step because his low voice is perfectly fine, and he can still sing an F above no C. He can still sing a high F, but I mean, he used to sing. G's and A flats and stuff, and he said, I just can't do it anymore. Um, um, here's the real bummer, is atrophy of the intrinsic muscles of the larynx. I have a teaching friend out at University of Colorado whose uh, vocal folds have atrophied, and it's not like she wasn't using her voice, but just genetically, I guess, with her family, um, she's more prone to this, and so her vocal folds are bowing a little bit, and so it's hard for her to get that normal closure, you know, so she runs out of breath faster, her sound is not as clear. Yeah, isn't that something to look forward to? Um, and because of that bowing, you get breathiness, etc. Dryness, less mucus is produced. <coughs> And um, you can get arthritis in the cricothyroid joint and the cricorhythmoid joints, which, you know, just like you have loss of mobility, sometimes people who get arthritis in their fingers or, you know, in their knee or whatever, if you get arthritis, you're going to have probably reduced mobility of a joint. Now, there's no pain involved. It's just, you know, the person's voice may be a little more sluggish. Um, higher notes may be a little more difficult. The vocal tract changes. Um, decreased elasticity in facial muscles. Um, people often start having some joint problems with their jaw. People lose their teeth. Yeah. Or their teeth are not as comfortable. So those are some things up on kind of the top end of the vocal tract. Has there been research on um, the way dentures affect singing? I don't know. That's a very good question. That's a very good question. I don't know. There's a doctoral <laughs> dissertation for you right there. <laughs> um, output changes, OK? Um, possible loss of range, power, and endurance, because if your vocal folds are bowing a little bit, gapping a little bit, that's going to affect, you know, if you try to get a little more clarity, then you're going to be tiring yourself. You may be, you know, getting into kind of a press thing. Um, certainly, 
you're not going to be as efficient in terms of turning your lung power into output of sound. So their voice is maybe not as powerful. That was certainly the case towards the end of Pavarotti's career, that he didn't have the power that he used to have. Um, and he certainly lost some of the, you know, the top was his really biggest calling card of his voice. And he did start to not, you know, and Domingo is singing high baritone stuff now. He doesn't sing tenor things too much. He can still sing A flats and A's, but not very often. He's very careful about which ones he does. Um, tone quality, typically more breathy, changes in habitual volume and overall dynamic range. I find my, I mean, I'll, I'll be 53 later this week. My voice feels great. Um, the one thing I notice with my voice is that if I have time off because of a vacation or a cold, it takes me longer to kind of get back up into shape. That's the main thing that I notice. Uh, maybe I'm just more picky, but um, I don't think so. It just takes me a little while longer. Um, overall, as far as my body goes, I don't recover quite as fast as I used to. Um, I mean, I remember back in you know high school and college, I could run 60 miles a week. You know, gonna run a race on the weekend. You know, if I run a race on the weekend. It's three or four days. I mean, I'll go out and run, but I'll run easy because I'm sore. I just don't bounce back as quickly. Yes, ma'am. Have you noticed any changes in the, the time it takes for you to um, get warm? Uh, no, I usually warm up pretty quickly, mm -hmm. vocally, um, as long as I'm kind of minding my stuff with um, reflux. Absolutely. Um, so, what's the difference between these three things? Between atrophy and dystrophy and edema. Okay, so edema is swelling. No, edema is something that's not swelling, right? Well, it's swelling, though. Swelling? It's, it can be swelling, okay. yeah. So, you can get short term edema, you know, if you have a cold or something like that. There's also edema, it's called Reinecke's edema, which is the smoker voice. And their vocal folds are kind of basically kind of permanently swollen. Okay, what about atrophy and dystrophy? What's the difference between those two? Atrophy is like when the muscles stop working, but they like weaken. They weaken, yeah. So loss of, of muscle mass, okay? Either due to, um, it could be due to um, not using them. Not using them, you're just out of shape. It could be some age related. Stop. Bless you. Thank you. Is dystrophy when they're not working? The they, they're not functioning properly. It's dystrophy. And that could be neurologic. It can be as a result of, you know, an injury. Um, so, yeah, these are things that, you know, down at the cellular and, and small tissue level may be going on as people age. I mean, People who have neurologic disorders often will have atrophy and dystrophy. I mean, my mom, towards the end of her life, with dealing with Parkinson's, had atrophy because she wasn't able to be using her voice or you know a lot of things. And then things didn't function well because of the neurologic stuff. And you know, you have cognitive issues and things going on. Um, Okay, I'm gonna show one more slide and then we'll leave it there for Wednesday. If you can stay, I got two or three more slides that are really good. Okay, so um, here we have females and males. The trained are the dashed ones and the untrained are the solid lines. So what does that tell you of the effect of training? relatively minor. Yeah, it's, this is fundamental frequency, so this is like speaking frequency. So the trained singers versus the untrained speakers, their <laughs> speaking range is just a little bit higher. Now, looking at men, uh, females versus males, you know, okay, here we have puberty going on, and so they vastly differ. But then what's going on out here? Yeah, that's interesting how the, the females start to go apart towards the end, but the men 
are coming closer together as they age. Well, true, but look at how the females bend down and the men bend up. What's the cause of that? Second puberty. Second puberty. <laughs> well, it's actually less of the hormones that drove the genders apart. Because it's you know estrogen and testosterone that drove their voices apart during puberty. Now, testosterone levels decline as men age, and estrogen levels decline in women. So as those hormone levels decline, their voices start to kind of coalesce again. So if you talk to people in their like late 80s and 90s, you know, it's like, is this grandma or grandpa? You know, they both kind of have this kind of kind of cracky voice that's kind of in the same range. Okay, two quick, because um, this is just really good quiz stuff. Uh, that's hearing things. This is so crucial, because I have friends I went to high school with. I mean, they look like they're 65, you know? If I didn't tell you I was going on 53, would you say I'm 53, no. other than the loss of hair? Yeah, okay, so the chronological age is not really what matters, it's the physiological age. So if your overall health is good, your chances of your voice remaining strong are good. Okay, here's two people. Okay, guess how old she is. 60. No. No, she's like 40. She's uh, 48. This is a friend of mine from undergrad school. I mean, we used to go out. We danced ballet together. Yeah, she's 48 in that picture. That's crazy. She's been, a, she's been a dancer, a dance instructor, a model, and a fitness instructor all her adult yeah. life. Wow. Okay. Um, her stomach looks like my mom's. That's why I guess she, she's Yeah, she has no freaking body fat. It's just like, you, you, you make me sick. Okay, <laughs> how about this guy? 52. Really? That's Herschel yeah. Walker. He played for the Cowboys as a oh, wide receiver okay. and a running back. This is him doing mixed martial arts at 52. Oh, crazy. I went to college with Herschel. I used to ride the bus with him. So, so both of these people went to school. I went to school with them. Okay, they're they're my age. You know, he's he's like a year older than me, and Natalie's a couple years younger than me. Hmm. So these are people who kept themselves in great shape. They do not look like your typical 48 or 52 year old. Now these are exceptional individuals, but I want to be exceptional. I don't know about you guys. I want to be exceptional. I don't want to be average. I want to be exceptional. So don't settle for less. Look at what people can do, you know? And you can do the same with your voice. Domingo's still singing at 75. Now granted, he's a world-class singer and he's been doing it all his life and his parents were singers, you know, good environment, good genes, no doubt. But you can do this. It's all about your lifestyle, you know, and keeping yourself in shape vocally and physically. That's really what it's about. And especially still goes to the gym. She still practices all the time, right? She still keeps her voice in shape. How about that? Surprise, you know? I admire her and I want to be just like that when I'm 15 years older, you know? I want to be still singing, still practicing, still keeping in shape. I see guys at the gym who are in their 70s and I'm like, man, I'm coming after you, buddy. <laughs> you and me, man. We may be 20 years apart, but I want to be you. Okay, we'll pick up here on Wednesday and get on the It could be, you might 
things might be unstable, but I think as, as your weight stabilizes and your fitness level and all stabilizes, I think you'd find, because I mean, Deborah Boyd lost a whole bunch of weight, she still seems just fine, Right. Yeah. you know? Um, people always talk about Collis and how well she was better before, you know, she lost all the weight. Well, she had a lot of problems she going had on. A weird double she time. had, she had, she also <laughs> had neurofibromyosis, you know, mm -hmm. which that's what she died of, you know. Oh, what? Yeah, it's, um, it's, it's not a good situation. Um, your body, your immune system basically attacks your muscles. Mm -hmm. um, now in her prime, um, yeah, she always had a weird voice. I mean, well, she did. Well, Rock have a name. She didn't lose the weight. No, she, she's a large, she, yeah, large I mean, she, she, and she gained weight over right. earlier. And so did Pavarotti. I mean, mm -hmm. you look at Pavarotti when he was, you know, in his uh, late 20s and early 30s. Uh, well, let's see, early 30s. Yeah, well, that'd be the mid 60s. Yeah, you can see some videos of him um, from like 1964, 65 on YouTube and stuff. He's not near as heavy. He's not near as heavy. He sounded great. Both. Now, did it probably hurt him overall? Yeah. I mean, because he started having joint problems with his knees and his hips, and he was less able to move around. I mean, this was a guy he had played soccer. He was a soccer goalie. He had been active all his life, you know. He still played tennis uh, later on in life. Um, you know, I, I think of Renee Fleming. I remember um, first time I saw her when she was here, um, and then the second time when she came back for the opening of the hall, and she had been worn out. And I mean, man, girl was she had. Michelle Obama arms, you know, <laughs> she was like fit. You've got to be to move her on the stage. Well, so and they do stage dates nowadays. There's a yeah, lot of there a lot is. more activity than there used to be. There is. A lot less park and bark. There is. I mean, granted, there are still going to be those amazing voices that are so singular. And Jackie that Barker, she hasn't lost it either. No, She's no, no, no. I know, her, I know her teacher up in Indiana. And yeah, she, um, but my gosh, what a yeah, voice, right? what a voice, you know? Um, so I think if it's done gradually, um, you know, that it's a change in your dietary habits and that you're exercising and those kinds of things, that it happens gradually over time, it should be the best thing in the world for you. Because you'll find, my gosh, with all that waste loss, I have so much more energy, right. you know, I feel better about myself self-esteem wise, mm -hmm. you know, I look better on stage, I have more endurance, you know. So I think the long term, it's certainly the right thing to do. And it's just, I, it's important that you do it the right way, you know, that it's a gradual loss, not a fad kind of thing, you know, that it's coupled with exercise, should be the best thing in the world for where a lot of people get into trouble is that, you know, they're singing and they're traveling a lot and then they don't have a regular exercise schedule and their eating habits, you know, they're eating in restaurants a lot, which has lots of fat and salt and so on. The really smart singers take their food with them. I mean, when I travel to go to conferences and things, I bring healthy snacks. You know, I bring my nuts, I bring fruit, dried fruit and things like that, pack it in my luggage. Um, cereal that I want to eat in the morning instead of going down to the breakfast bar and having the omelet with the sausage and the, you know, it's like I know better. <laughs> I'm having a hard enough time keeping my weight stable, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's just a matter of, of discipline, really, to, to do that. But I don't think there's a big concern about it having a detrimental effect. I think if anything, it's going to just help you mm -hmm. all the more. So and loss of power and things, I would think is, as you get more and more physically fit, that's not gonna be an issue at all, you know? If anything, it's gonna help you with casting because people say, wow, you move better, you look better, you bet, I got you, you got the part, you know? Yeah. Was that a question or just a? Just a thought. I know it has to happen. I know it does. It, it 
it's as simple as going and taking a walk for 30 minutes every day. Mm -hmm. You know? And just, like, when you go to eat a meal, that you say, I'm going to fill my plate with my different colors and types of foods, and that's all I get. No seconds. You know, any snacking that you do is real healthy snacks. Um, you know, soft drinks and energy drinks and things like that. Oh my gosh, so many calories. I guess my concern is um, since, so the, probably like in the past month and a half, maybe two months, I've lost like 30 pounds. Yeah, Ooh, that's fantastic.